Good evening, everyone, and welcome at our first lecture about CRISPR-Cas, Everything You Need to Know by Elias Adriansen. These lectures are organized by the KVCV, or the Royal Flemish Chemical Society, of which I will give you, you now a short introduction. The KVCV is a chemical society within Flanders, so the north, the Dutch-speaking part of Belgium. We are a community of chemists in Flanders and beyond because everyone can become a member of our society. And our members mainly are students, PhD students, academics, teachers and professionals. So we really represent, so we do represent and strive to support everyone in the chemical education industry and society. We mainly organize lectures about popular scientific topics for the general audience or more domain specific workshops. After our events, we typically have a networking reception. However, this is unfortunately not possible in our online editions. We also organize various conferences representing the different disciplines in the chemistry. We also strive to organize a company visit at least once a year. In the past, we already went to Janse Pharmaceutica and Yumicor, of which you can see a picture here. And this is to get to know the local chemical industry. Next year, we planned a company visit to Cargill, which is an agro-industrial concern. We also organize every year our science quiz, which is a very popular and multidisciplinary science quiz. We are also involved in our yearly national science day, science day, where we bring science to the society. At this day, we typically perform chemistry demos and also some do experiments for children. Here you have an overview of our upcoming events. Next week, we have our KQLA lectures about immunity and re uh, responses. We also strive to organize each month a lecture, an online lecture. Today is the first one. And in December, so next month, we will organize a lecture on astrochemistry. And as already mentioned, our company visit to Cargill, will, which will be in April, of course, if the COVID-19 situation allows this. We also uh, have Mense Molecula, which is our magazine and is distributed to all our members each month. So this means we have 12 editions a year. In this magazine, you can find news about the chemical industry, academics, but also about our own activities and scientific advancements and much more. If you are a member of KVCV, you are automatically also a member of UCHEMS, the European Chemical Society. As member of UCHEMS, you also have various discounts uh, on various activities endorsed by UCHEMS. If you uh, are a member of KVCV, you have re your reduced prices at our activities. You also receive our magazine, as already mentioned, Mens and Molecular, but you're also part of the chemistry community, and this helps you to extend your knowledge and broaden your network. If you are interested in a membership, I recommend you to visit the kvcv.be slash membership page. For PhD students, for example, this is only 12 euros a year. If you want any more information also about our events and registration of our events, I recommend you to visit our page, kvcv, our website, kvcv.be. But we are also on social media, so you can also reach us via our social media channels. We have a Facebook page and a LinkedIn page. And I also kindly would like to ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, especially for the people who are now watching via the YouTube live stream. This series of lectures is also supported by Chemistry Europe. So check their journals, which might be interest for interest of interest for you for your next publications. We are now about to start our lecture of this evening. If you have any questions during this lecture, you can 
always type your questions in the Q&A section on the Zoom platform or in the chat section on the YouTube live stream. And let me now introduce you to our speaker of today, Elias Adriansens. Elias graduated as Master of Science in Biochemistry and Biotechnology at the University of Antwerp. After that, he also obtained a master's degree in pharmacology at the University of Oxford. During his studies, he was already awarded with various prizes, including a high profile achievement award from Wilson College in Oxford and with our own award of the Royal Flemish Chemical Society. Although he only recently graduated as doctor in the biochemistry and biotechnology at the Flemish, Flemish Institute of Biotechnology, he already published various articles in peer-reviewed journals, including Autophagy, Nature Communications, Scientific Reports, and Brain. Besides these manuscripts, he also published two opinion letters, one in the Belgian newspaper The Standard and one in the journal Science. From January onwards, Elias will start with a new adventure as postdoctoral researcher in the Max Perus labs in the group of Professor Saskia Martins in Vienna, Austria. Then I will give the word to our speaker, Elias Adriansens, and I would say, Elias, the floor or the screen in this case is yours. Thank you, thank you. So let me first start with um, thanking the organizers for actually inviting me to speak here tonight. Um, I have to say it's been really well organized and probably one of the few merits of this pandemic is that we can connect with more people um, in this virtual space and that we're perhaps not even limited to people who live in Belgium at this point. So um, today's talk is gonna be about CRISPR-Cas and um, as you all may know, it's a very powerful gene editing technology. Um, and I wanted to start with um, showing a photo that I still find on my phone, which is from when I was still a student in Oxford. I took it when Emmanuel Charpentier actually came to, um, to Oxford to speak about her discovery of the CRISPR-Cas system. And this was about a good year after the, the first paper on CRISPR. Um, and I still recall this as a very, um, I still recall this moment as um, it's been, it was a room, super busy, um, I, I even made the picture two minutes past five because um, the room was just so filled with people. They kept coming in, they had to sit at the, at the stairs. Um, and I think that already demonstrated the initial interest uh, of the people in this technology because it was just one year after the first discovery, but the first papers had already come out demonstrating that they could actually reproduce what they found in these initial papers. And they already reported that this technology was actually very efficient and very easy to work with. So I think that sort of set rise to um, the start of this entire new field of genome editing. Um, and I think it was only one or two months after this first lecture that one of the first conferences on CRISPR actually also took place in Oxford. I was fortunate enough to be there and it's just very exciting to see where the field has come um, since that point. So what we're gonna talk about today is I'm first gonna go over some of the basic principles of CRISPR with you. Um, I'm gonna mention some pitfalls that you may encounter if you work with the CRISPR-Cas technology. I'm gonna share some applications and then I'm gonna give a few examples of how CRISPR is actually already entering our society. And we're gonna end with perhaps my favorite part, which is um, the fights about the Nobel Prize and the patents. And I, I consider this a little bit of gossiping, but it's, uh, you may know the outcome of the Nobel Prize, but you may not know what, has, uh, what preceded this. So what is CRISPR? CRISPR basically is nothing more than the immune system of bacteria that protects them from viral infections. So in case a virus would infect uh, a bacterial cell and it would inject its DNA into the bacterium, the bacterium is actually able to copy some of this viral DNA and paste it into its own DNA and its own genome, sort of as a memory so that if a similar virus would infect the same bacterium again, it can use this memory to quickly recognize the DNA from this virus and destroy it um, 
as soon as it recognizes this. So basically, this is nothing more than an immune system that is very similar to the human immune system. We have been infected before by something, we create some kind of a memory, and we can use this memory to rapidly recognize the same infection again and destroy it before it, affect, it affects us um, once more. And what's shown here is basically what the DNA of this bacterium then would look like. So you have here a locus of different Cas proteins that is followed by a cluster of, in blue, the viral DNA fragments, which are um, interspersed by uh, repeat fragments from the bacterium. So basically every piece here in blue would be a different viral sequence and would be part of this memory of what viral sequences look like. And that's also where the name actually came from. It's a clustered, regularly interspaced, short palindromic repeats. So the repeats refer to these regions. And just once more, here you can see the repeats, and this is the viral DNA that is built into the genome of the bacterium that it can use then to recognize this virus when it were to infect the same bacterium once more. And if you zoom, on, zoom in on this system, it's actually composed of three components. You have the CRISPR RNA, which recognizes the viral DNA, which is shown here. It recognizes it, it binds to it. Then there is a tracer RNA, which together with the CRISPR RNA actually forms a 3D shape that is able to recruit a protein called Cas9. The Cas9 protein is recruited to this particular site in the DNA, and it can cut the viral DNA and destroy it. And this was basically the discovery of Emmanuel Charpentier of how this system works and of these three components. She then teamed up with the lab of Jennifer Dotna, and the lab of Jennifer Dotna actually recognized the potential of this system to use it as a genome editing tool. So what they did is they first of all fused these two uh, CRISPR RNAs in the tracker and the tracer RNA by a small linker so that you get a single guide RNA. And then they recognized that all you would have to do is change these 20 nucleotides and then you would be able to guide the Cas9 protein to any different side of the genome that you prefer it to go to and cut. So basically, all you need to change is 20 nucleotides, which is literally the, the size of a PCR primer. There is actually only one condition. These 20 nucleotides, you can only select them if they are just upstream of a PAM sequence or a PAM motif, and that's a protospacer adjacent motif. And basically, that's a three nucleotide sequence of NGG, where N can be any nucleotide and then followed by GG. So for all, of the, for all of us, and that's, I think, the majority of the CRISPR field, we're working with the Cas9 protein from the Streptococcus pie genus strain. Um, they all, all of them just have to look for um, a PAMODIF of NGG, and then they take the 20 nucleotides upstream. So as you can see, this is the single guide RNA here in red, and then you have the 20 nucleotides just upstream. If the Cas9 protein is then recruited, what it will do is it will cut the DNA three nucleotides upstream of the PAM sequence. If you were to work with a Cas9 protein from a different bacterial strain, then you would be dealing with a different um, PAM motif. And that also means that the, the technology is basically limited by the presence of PAM motifs, but fortunate enough, such NGG sequence um, appears on average every 10 to 20 nucleotides. So that actually gives you um, perhaps the freedom to target nearly any sequence in the, in the genome. Now, what happens when the Cas9 protein actually induces a double strand break? The cell can respond by activating one of two pathways. Either it will activate an homology end joining pathway, which I always refer to as a sloppy pathway. All this pathway does is fusing the two loose ends together as quickly as possible, often in a very sloppy way, building in some insertions or deletions um, so it builds in some small errors, and due to these errors, which can be insertions, deletions, you may actually change the reading frame, and this leads to a premature stop codon. The cell can also respond by activating the homology direct repair pathway, and then it will actually use the other chromosome that is not being cut, um, and it will use it as a template for rebuilding its own DNA. However, now as researchers, we can actually do a very clever trick. What we could do is we could introduce um, a repair template, so which is a piece of DNA that we inject into the cells along with the CRISPR components. And if this piece of DNA is identical to the sequence where we made a cut and we introduce it in a far excess compared to the other chromosome, so that the cell will actually 
we could actually fool the cell so that the, actually, the cell will actually think that the piece of DNA that we are introducing is the DNA of the other chromosome. And if we then build in a very tiny mutation in this repair template, the cell will actually build in this point mutation in its DNA. So what you do here is you fool the cell by providing a template that is not naturally in the cell, which can contain a small mutation. And the cell will then use this as a, a, ref, as a reference template to repair its own DNA. And you are able to build in the point mutation. And this actually means that this pathway um, usually leads to, the, to a premature stop codon in the formation of a knockout cell, whereas this pathway allows you to do very precise gene edits. And this is just one example from, from our lab. Um, as a lab, we're focused on a small chaperone called HSPP1 in the context of uh, Charcot-Marie 2 disease. And what we did at the beginning of my PhD was um, trying to make some cell lines that are knockout for this gene. And as you can see here, this is a Western blot for different clones that, that I made. And as you can see, basically all of them were knockout from the first time uh, as demonstrated by a polyclonal HSPB1 antibody. And if you then look at the DNA sequence, you see that this is the guide RNA, this is the pump sequence, and this is where the Cas9 protein would cut. And you would see that we have in the different clones either a deletion, a small insertion, or an insertion and a deletion, but all of them actually change the reading frame. And what you get is you get a different peptide sequence with a premature stop codon, which will be rapidly degraded by the cell. And functionally, what you get is you get a knockout because you're inactivating or you promote the degradation of this, uh, this peptide. And this was just the first example for us demonstrating how powerful this technology is because it worked on the first instance and actually all of our clones were knockout at that point. And I think that's what our researchers have experienced as well. So I found this uh, piece of text in New York Times, which quotes um, a well-known geneticist or a CRISPR geneticist, Bruce Conklin, who said that, in the past, it was a student's entire PhD to change one gene, whereas now a student can master it in an hour and produce an edited gene within a couple of days. And that's really true. Um, it just takes you a couple of days to a couple of weeks to produce um, a new knockout cell line. And this is further demonstrated here on this slide, where in the past, it used to take up to two years to produce a transgenic mouse model well, now with the CRISPR technology, you can actually produce a, a transgenic gene editor mouse model in just, as, it, just uh, uh, as little as eight weeks. The other thing that's very appealing about this CRISPR technology is that because it is so efficient, you could actually target cells with more than one guide RNA. So as you can see here, there were two different guide RNAs targeting two different genes. They injected it in the zygote and then they um, looked at the pups that were born from the mouse. And basically all that is is they quantified how often both alleles for TET1 and TET2 were edited. And what you can see is that the system is so efficient that in a far majority, all four alleles were edited, just demonstrating how efficient um, this method is. And that of course inspired other people to do even crazier things such as George Church who uh, tried to smash the gene editing record in pigs by editing more than 60 genes in pigs to uh, enable organ transplantation into humans. And of course, it wasn't limited to human cells or, or pigs. Um, the CRISPR system is so versatile that you can actually also use it in monkeys, you could use it in Drosophila. Uh, of course, you have the mouse, you have pigs, you have plants. I think pretty much any model organism that's frequently used already has an available CRISPR system at this point uh, in time. So I'd like to go over now are some of the pitfalls that you may encounter using the CRISPR-Cas technology. So very, from the very first start uh, of CRISPR or from the very beginning of CRISPR, there were reports about high frequency off-target mutagenesis by this system. Um, and they were published by different groups. And I think until today, that's still probably one of the major concerns working with this technology is that there is a risk that if there is a DNA sequence that looks very much like our guide RNA sequence, which is not necessarily 100% identical, but is very similar, you could, the Cas9 protein could be fooled by the sequence and it could actually go there and bind and cut the DNA, introducing a non-intended off-target mutation. Um, I have to say that some of the initial reports 
reports as high frequency of target mutagenesis. I think that was slightly biased. Um, I think today we have a much better understanding of how guide RNAs are properly designed. And I think with a proper guide RNA design, we can actually reduce the chance of having off targets um, significantly. The other thing that may have happened with some of these initial reports was that uh, we may have been using the wrong tools to look at where Cas9 was binding and cutting the DNA, inducing off targets. And I'm just going to give you one example of that. This is, a, this is one of my favorite papers, basically, that I read at the time. Um, the goal here was to um, introduce or to cut a gene called EMX1. And what they did here is a chromatin, immun chromatin immunoprecipitation. And basically, they were looking at which sites in the genome uh, Cas9 protein would be binding to. So this is the on-target uh, loci, and these are all off-target sites where the Cas9 protein could potentially bind because the sequences are very similar. And as you can see here, for instance, for off-target 2, you have an equal, um, an equal amount of Cas9 bound as, on, as compared to the on-target site. So it seems that Cas9 can efficiently bind to this uh, off-target region, and the authors then actually went on to study whether this Cas9 bind binding would also lead to um, gene editing. And that's interesting. What they actually found was that it does, ne does not necessarily lead to gene editing. What you can see here is for off-target 2, for instance, in presence of the guide RNA, there is no difference. So the two bands are the same size, they're not cut. So it means that even though the Cas9 protein was binding to this off-target site, it's not cutting the DNA per se. Whereas if you look for EMX1, which is on target, in presence of the guide RNA, this upper band is nearly entirely disappeared and has produced two smaller bands, which demonstrates that there was effective cutting of the DNA. And the authors actually also mentioned this in, well, in the discussion of their paper, where they write that surprisingly, while Cas9 was able to bind various genomic sequences containing a pump sequence, it um, it didn't lead to off targets because the number of off targets were very limited. Um, and I think this is an, a key observation that Cas9 binding to the DNA does not necessarily imply that it would also cut the DNA at these sites. And in order to understand this concept a, slight, a little bit better, I think it's important for us to understand how Cas9 is actually binding the DNA and um, how, how does it work? So basically Cas9, together with the guide RNA, are scanning for PAM sequences. Because as you remember, I told you before, this is the absolute prerequisite for the system to work. So it's scanning for uh, PAM sequences. And as soon as it finds a PAM sequence, it will try to see if the guide RNA is matching the sequence. So it will start unfolding the guide RNA and binding to the DNA as long as it's complementary. Imagine there would be a mismatch here at this stage. The Cas9 protein would recognize this mismatch and go off the DNA again and look for a different site in the genome, which may be the correct site. However, is, if this guide RNA is matching to the DNA sequence, it will further bind. And when it's completely bound, it will start opening the DNA and the Cas9 protein will cut the DNA, creating a double strand DNA break. And that's also uh, demonstrated here in this video. It's, it's an absolute beautiful study, which was published in Science. And what you see here on the left is a little video of a, cell, a cellular nucleus, uh, where you can find all the DNA. And the white dots are Cas9 proteins. And the Cas9 proteins were actually loaded with a non-targeting guide RNA. So that means that this guide RNA does not have a match anywhere in this genome, but yet, the Cas9 protein will be scanning the DNA, looking for places where it could bind, unfold the guide RNA, and trying to see if that would match. And I'm gonna play the video, and what you will see is that the Cas9 proteins are moving all over the nucleus, looking for sites where it could potentially bind. And basically, as soon as it notices that this is not a matching sequence, it will leave the DNA and go elsewhere. And what you see here on the right is sort of a, a cumulative effect of what, you, what is happening here on the left. It sort of traces the, the trajectory of the Cas9 proteins. Um, and as you can see, the Cas9 proteins are really scanning the entire nucleus, looking for that particular sequence where the guide RNA would match to. However, in this case, given since there is no matching um, sequence, it will always be shortly binding and going off the DNA in a couple of milliseconds. And this is in a very different time frame compared to uh, 
a Cas9 uh, protein with a matching guide RNA, because if the, the guide RNA is matching to the DNA sequence, it can actually take up to a couple of hours before the Cas9 protein has induced a double strand break and, and left the DNA again. So just to give you an understanding of uh, the time scale, here we're looking at millisecond interactions and a true binding event would actually uh, be in the, in the time frame of perhaps even a couple of hours. Now this study by Patrick Sue actually further um, illuminated us on the principles of guide RNA design. And I often present this slide to people who start working with CRISPR because if you are designing your own guide RNAs, I think there are a few rule of thumbs to take from this paper. First of all, if you have a guide RNA that has two mismatches, it can still lead to a substantial amount of off-targeting uh, effects. However, if you have a guide RNA that has three or more mismatches with other loci in the genome, you probably have very little chance of, of getting an off-target uh, event. So that means that a proper guide RNA design is probably better protected from off-target uh, effects if the mismatches are three or higher. Now, there is one more rule to take from this paper. That is the position of these mismatches also matters. So here you would have the PAM sequence. This would be the seeding sequence. And then you go down um, the guide RNA. And if this, these mismatches occur very early on in the seeding region, you would have no um, Cas9 cutting of the DNA. However, if the three mismatches happen all the way down, far away from the PAM sequence, then the Cas9 protein may become slightly promiscuous and might st may still induce a DNA double strand break. So I think the two things to take from this slide is having three or more mismatches should nearly protect you, should nearly always protect you from off-target effects, especially if you have a mismatch early on in the sequence nearby the PAM sequence. Another study actually made a transgenic mouse model for Cas9. So this is a mouse expressing the Cas9 protein in every cell of their body. But as long as we don't introduce any guide RNA, this Cas9 protein is present, but it's unable to cut the DNA. And what they did is they aged this, this mouse um, and they saw no overt phenotype. So there's no phenotype at all, as long as there's no uh, guide RNA present in these animals, which means that the Cas9 protein may hold the potential to bind and cut DNA, it's unable to do this in absence of a guide RNA. Now, as, you, as I told you at the beginning, basically CRISPR was first discovered as the immune system of bacteria, so that when a virus would infect the bacterium and introduce its DNA, the Cas9 protein would bind it and destroy the, the DNA of the virus. However, of course, in nature, there's always um, a battle between surviving and um, between species to survive. And basically, viruses um, were very clever in that they started injecting their DNA along with a piece of protein that would actually inhibit Cas9 so that even though Cas9 would be able to bind this DNA, due to this inhibition, it can, it can no longer destroy the DNA here. Um, and since this was discovered, actually the potential for genome editing was very obvious because if you, were be able, if you were to be able to use these inhibitors to inhibit Cas9, what we could do is we could set up an experiment where we would introduce the Cas9 with a guide RNA into our cells for a couple of hours, perhaps a day. And then we can assume that Cas9 has cut the DNA at a precise position where we wanted it to cut the DNA and to avoid Cas9 from binding to other loci and introducing a double strand break at an off-target uh, site, we could perhaps make use of these inhibitors to stop the process very early on um, in our experiments. So as I just mentioned, one of the main pitfalls of working with CRISPR-Cas are the off-targets, um, but there is another one. Um, there is a disbalance between the non-homology end joining and the HDR pathway. So as I said before, when there's a double strand break induced by the Cas9 protein, the cell can respond by activating one of two pathways. And actually, in the far majority of the cases, the cell will respond by activating this pathway, the non-homology end joining pathway, which leads, to knockout, uh, which leads to insertions or deletions, often associated with knockouts. Well, it's often desired for scientists to actually get uh, this pathway activated because with this donor template, we're able to build in small, small, uh, small 
mutations to perhaps even correct uh, a disease causing mutation. Um, but the problem is that this pathway is only activated in the minority of the cases. Now, one of the reasons why that's the case could be because that the non-homology end joining pathway is active throughout the cell cycle, whereas the homology directed repair pathway is only active in the SG2 phase of the cell cycle. So simply by chance, you have a bigger chance that, for instance, the homology end joining pathway would be activated than the homology directed repair pathway. Of course, scientists uh, were trying to skew this balance by doing small molecule screens, looking for compounds that could either inhibit the non-homology end joining or could simply promote the activity of the HDR pathway. And um, there have been quite a few studies that have published small molecules that were able to change this balance. But I think it's only fair to say that even until today, we don't really have a very good molecule that can make a huge difference. There's a couple of molecules out there that have a slight improvement in uh, HDR activity. But I think for uh, if you're to design your own experiments, I think you can make a bigger difference with a good experimental design than relying on any of the existing molecules. Now there's one exception to this rule. So as I said, in the far majority of the cases, the non-homology end, non end joining pathway would be activated. However, for some reason in embryonic stem cells, the HDR pathway is far more active and you, it's much easier to introduce um, point mutations or little, correction, little corrections uh, simply because this pathway is more active in these cells. So people working with stem cells are actually very fortunate. There are also some other solutions to this problem. So because the classical CRISPR-Cas system is very ineffective in making small uh, point mutations using the HDR pathway, people started looking for alternative methods to still be able to precisely edit the genome, introducing minor mutations or minor changes. Uh, and one way to do this was um, is by using base editors. So basically what you're doing here is you're using the same CRISPR-Cas system, a guide RNA coupled to Cas9, but the Cas9 protein is now mutated. So you would inactivate the Cas9 protein so that it can still bind to DNA, but it can no longer cut the DNA, or at least not introduce a double strand break. And what you would do next is you would fuse another protein onto this Cas9 protein that is actually able to change the DNA sequence. So in this case, what you get is you get a guide RNA that steers the Cas9 protein to a particular side in the DNA. And then this base editor is actually able to change the DNA sequence right here at this sequence. And there are different kinds of base editors. We have C base editors, we have A base editors. Um, and the good thing about them is that they're far more efficient at introducing precise uh, DNA changes compared to the homology directory repair pathway. So the efficiency of this system is much higher. And that's probably also why this system has been adopted quickly by the research community. However, there's one downside to this system. The base editors are, do not allow you to make all of the changes that you would like to make. And lucky enough, um, there are now prime editors, which is a, an even different system that actually allows you to partly rewrite the DNA code and allows you to make any changes that you, you desire. Now, regarding the, the off-targets, also for the off-targets, I think um, there is uh, good news on the horizon um, because as you can imagine, gene editing with the classical CRISPR-Cas system or using the base editors, all of them have the risk of introducing an off-target, an unintended off-target mutation. And if you do this at the level of the DNA, that's actually very vulnerable, especially when we're thinking of taking these methods or these technologies to the clinic for treating people with um, horrible diseases. However, recently these CRISPR systems have also been converted to the RNA level and now what you can do is you can actually use similar systems to edit the RNA. And I think that's a much safer option because while the genome is um, inherited to the next generations, if you were to edit the uh, RNA, the RNA is rapidly turned over. So even if we were to make um, an unintended um, off-target mutation, it would be degraded quickly after its synthesis. So this would not be a long lasting effect, whereas this would, could have potentially long lasting effects. So what I've shared with you so far 
is that CRISPR is basically the bacterial immune system that was turned into a genome tool. The cell can respond by activating one of two pathways, the non-homology end joining pathway or the HDR pathway. There is a disbalance, which is for some of our applications still unfortunate, but the technology is very easy to use, especially if we're looking for making knockouts. And it actually inspired some people to uh, go on to crazy projects, editing up to 60 genes um, at once. So this is really the good of CRISPR. However, what I've done is also shared the bad of CRISPR. CRISPR has the potential of inducing off targets. And this um, is potentially risky if we think about using this technology in the clinic. So I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go over a couple of applications um, using the Cas9 protein or a variant of Cas9. The first example I'd like to share with you is on Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where patients have mutations in the gene called dystrophin. And the far majority of the mutations are actually uh, between the exons 40, 45 and 55. And in this study, the researchers were using stem cells. And what they did is they used CRISPR to cut out a large fraction of this gene. You have to know that this is a very, very large gene. So cutting out 10 exons is actually not even um, so strange because what happens is that if you have a mutation in this region, it leads to the degradation of dystrophin. If you cut out a couple of these exons, what will happen is you will produce a protein that is smaller than the actual protein, but suddenly it becomes stable. It's no longer degraded. So if you were to have a mutation in this region, you could use a CRISPR system to cut out a couple of these exons. The cell will start producing a smaller dystrophin gene, but which is still partially functional and which can restore the phenotype, at least in iPS cells. The same principle was applied in the muscular dystrophy mouse model, um, introducing uh, AAV vectors with the uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system. And basically here they were making even more precise edits. They were cutting out only a single exon, um, making the protein slightly smaller, but instead of being degraded, it was expressed again, and it's still partially functional, improving the phenotype of this mouse model. And then in this study, they were working with stem cells once more. However, here they were no longer looking at cutting out certain exons. Here they were really trying to restore the uh, mutation. So this is what the healthy gene would look like. Well, in this Duchenne muscular dystrophy patient, the band is much smaller because it's lacking a couple of these exons. But they then use CRISPR to knock these exons back in. And what you can see is that in the healthy volunteer, you have a normal expression of dystrophin. The protein is degraded in the muscular dystrophy patient. And um, upon CRISPR editing, they were able to restore the expression of this gene, rescuing the phenotype in these cells. Another example um, relates to cancer, where they were using the Cas9 uh, mouse that I presented to you before. So remember, this Cas9, is, this Cas9 mouse model is expressing Cas9 in every cell of its body. And all you would have to do is you would have to use virus to introduce guide RNAs into the mouse. In this case, they introduced guide RNAs against KRAS, P53, and LKB1 in the lungs of these mice. And what you get is that already after one week, you get a small tumor being formed here in the lungs, which is progressively getting worse over time. Um, and this is now an entirely new tool to induce tumor formation um, in a mouse model. We could also use CRISPR for more um, exotic uh, changes such as chromosomal rearrangements. As you may all know, chromosomal rearrangements are the frequent cause of genetic disorders, of infertility or cancer. But actually until today, we were unable to reconstruct events that we, have, that we see in some of the patients where you would have two chromosomes fused to each other. Actually, well, with CRISPR now, it's actually possible again because you could design guide RNAs targeting the two different um, chromosomes leading to the formation of a fused chromosome, uh, phenocopying these chromosomal rearrangements that we see in some of the patients. And perhaps the biggest potential of CRISPR came from um, genome scale screening. So this is something that has been adopted quickly by the research community and which has huge potential for uh, cell biology. So how does it work? So in this study, they were working with melanoma cells, which are sensitive to a drug called femorufenib, also better known as PLX, or in this study at least referred to as PLX. 
and basically PLX will inhibit the growth of these melanoma cells. However, we know from patients that some patients become resistant to the therapy due to mutations in the DNA. So what happens is that normally cells would grow at a constant pace. However, if we add the PLX, these melanoma cells will stop dividing or stop growing um, until you would find a mutation that makes it resistant. And then suddenly what you would get is you would get a normal growth again along this curve. So how can you study which genes are responsible for this um, drug resistance? So what you do is you make a library of guide RNAs with a guide RNA for every different gene in our genome. So that means 20,000 gene uh, guide RNAs. We clone them into vectors and make lentivirus so that every lentiviral particle would contain a different guide RNA. So that means that you would have a multitude of 20,000 lentiviral uh, particles where each particle would be carrying a different guide RNA. If we then take the melanoma cells that I showed you just before and we infect them with this library of lentivirus, then every cell will receive one lentiviral particle and will be knocked out for a different gene. So what you get is you get a pool of cells where every cell is knocked out for a different gene. If we then add the drug PLX, what you will get is that the cells will stop growing except for those few cells that have a mutation in a gene that makes them resistant to the therapy. And these few cells will continue growing and overtake the culture. And if you were then to look at, let's say seven days after this experiment, um, seven days after treating them with PLX, the far majority of the cells will have stopped growing and will, will be dead. Whereas a small minority will have kept growing because they're become resistant to the therapy. And this is exactly what you see here on this side, <coughs> where you see that only a couple of genes, if you knock them out, made them resistant to uh, the PLX therapy. And these genes are real drivers of um, drug resistance in melanoma. So the next example I'm gonna show is uh, about a dead Cas9. So basically what this is, this is um, a Cas9 protein that's been mutated so that it can still bind the DNA, but it can no longer cut the DNA. And I already introduced this concept to you before, because what you can do is together with the guide RNA, you can bring the Cas9 protein to a specific side of the genome. And if you then fuse it to another protein, this other protein can mo modify the DNA that is nearby this site. And in this case, they actually fused Cas9 to uh, a protein that can change the methylation and they steer it to the uh, locus of MyoD. And MyoD is typically expressed in muscle cells. So if you would introduce this system in fibroblasts, you can change the methylation of the MyoD locus and you can actually convert fibroblasts into myoblasts. And this is exactly what you see here. These are the fibroblasts which have very little MyoD expressing, whereas here you have a clear conversion to myod positive cells. The last example I would like to give is um, gene drives. This is something that not all of you may have heard about, um, but actually is something that has huge potential, but perhaps also huge risk. Now, what's going on here? You would have a piece of DNA built into the genome containing guide RNAs that target the opposite chromosome at the same site. So it will bind and cut the DNA on the same locus at the opposite chromosome. And what will happen is that the cell will try to repair this double strand break by using this chromosome to um, repair its template. Well, what you can do now is if you make small mutations here so that the, castline, so that the guide RNAs can no longer bind, what you will get is you will go from a heterozygous situation where you only have one allele with this locus to a homozygous situation because it will use this one as a reference template to repair the broken chromosome. So this is another example of the same principle. This locus has guide RNAs that will bind the other chromosome at the same site. For the repair, the, chromosome, the cell will use this as a reference and it will build in this locus on both chromosomes. And basically what you have is you go from a heterozygous situation to a homozygous situation in all of the cases. Now, if you were to introduce a system in mosquitoes and you would uh, mate mosquitoes uh, that are blue with the gray ones, 
what you would get is normally the offspring would be 50% blue, 50% gray. However, due to this gene conversion from heterozygous to a homozygous state, actually the entire offspring is going to be blue. And then if, you, if, you, if they're made again with the gray one, the entire offspring is going to be blue. And this means that this gene will actually spread very rapidly throughout the population of mosquitoes. And it has the potential to actually revolutionize um, some, some things that some of our problems in, in our society. However, what we're doing is we're really cheating evolution because we're promoting the spread of a particular uh, DNA sequence. So you can imagine that you could use this as a gene drive uh, in the fight uh, to engineer mosquitoes in the fight against malaria. But of course, you, I think you can also sense that there is a huge risk to using such systems because um, activists, for instance, they already came out against this technology because if you let such gene drives loose in, our, in nature, they may at, at first instance um, be protective against malaria, but if they start mutating, there is no way to take them back out of nature anymore. So they would rapidly spread across um, the nature. And this is probably also why US intelligence uh, referred to gene editing as a weapon of mass destruction, because they saw that this technology could allow people with bad intentions to make, for instance, killer mosquitoes or a, a deadly virus that would snip into people's DNA. And if you had let this loose in nature, there's no way of taking it out anymore. So we're coming towards the large, last section of our presentation. I'm gonna give you a couple of um, examples of how CRISPR is already entering our, into our society. And we're gonna finish off with uh, the noble news. So as you may know or not know, um, you can already buy gene edited CRISPR mushrooms in the US because they were considered uh, safe and they can be sold without oversight. A Swedish researcher actually decided to gene edit its own crops and make a lovely pasta with it. Um, and as far as we know, the man is still alive. In China, then again, they decided to use CRISPR to make very cute micro pigs that were sold as pets um, to, the, to the society. So these seem all relatively um, unvulnerable or non-dangerous uh, modifications, but that wasn't the last of it. Already in 2015, Chinese researchers tried to modify human embryos um, to see if that could be potentially used in the future as a, as a therapy uh, to eradicate some of the diseases that we're dealing with. And of course, this was rapidly uh, responded by an inter international gene uh, summit on gene editing, where some of the most, uh, some of the biggest experts on gene editing came together to discuss these uh, recent events of gene editing on embryos. And um, they came to the conclusion that there was a general ban, general ban on human germline editing until we have a better understanding of how CRISPR works and of the potential risks that come with this technology. Um, so since that day onwards, it was forbidden to do any gene editing on germline uh, models. However, unfortunately, that didn't stop some researchers. There was a Chinese scientist called Zhang Kui He who in 2018 reported that he had uh, gene edited uh, two twins that, gave, that were born in 2018 and that there was a third baby on the way where he introduced, um, where he tried to modify the DNA of these babies. And I think all of us feel that this was absolutely irresponsible, but rather than speaking about the ethics of this, I would like to talk to you about the science behind this. Because what he was trying to do is he was trying to copy something that is naturally occurring in our society. So there is a gene called CCR5, and there are people who have a small 32 base pair deletion in this gene, which confers them protection against HIV infection, because HIV uses this receptor to infect cells. And this is what, um, professor, what scientist he was trying to copy in the babies. However, as you can see in the baby Lulu, he actually made a 50 base pair deletion just upstream of this region. Whereas in Nana, one chromosome had a four base pair deletion and you had a one base pair insertion. So clearly none of these four, none of these three uh, gene edits phenocopied this, um, this protective allele. And it's questionable whether this is any protective at all or perhaps even harmful. And this is just further demonstrated here. This is the normal, um, this is a protective allele. And you can see that in Nana, this is still partially uh, phenocopied. However, in Lulu, the mutation is of a complete different nature 
And rather than being protective, it could potentially be very harmful for the baby. Of course, this was quickly followed uh, by an international storm. And earlier this year, uh, the Chinese scientist was sent to prison. Unfortunately, that didn't stop others from having similar plans. Uh, already last year, a Russian scientist announced that he would be, he plans to do CRISPR editing and actually already had approval, ethical approval from the Russian government at this point. So as you see, CRISPR is already really entering our society. Um, and now we're coming to the last part of the presentation where we're gonna speak about the noble and the patent fights. So CRISPR was actually invented by multiple people. And what I'm showing you here are the four main characters of this story. We have on one hand, Jennifer Dotner from the University of California, Berkeley, who published together with Emmanuel Charpentier, the first paper on how the CRISPR system could be used as a genome editing tool. Quickly followed by a paper of Feng Zhang from the Harvard MIT Broad Institute, who published at the same time as George Church, also from the Harvard MIT Broad Institute. And basically what you see here on this picture is four faces. And the problem is that Nobel Prizes are only awarded to treat people. So there is one person too much on this picture and that actually let give rise to a very nasty fight among these people and institutions of these people for who were the true inventors of CRISPR and who would deserve the Nobel Prize and who actually has right to the patents that could be used uh, or worth probably a couple of billion uh, euros or dollars um, in the future. So what is this all about? This is about three papers, one from the charpentier Dotner lab where they actually showed how the system works and how it's, able, how it's able to cut DNA in a test tube. And what they wrote in their discussion is that this system um, is effective in the test tube in doubles, introducing double strand bakes uh, in DNA and has the potential to be used as a genome editing tools in cells, just as tools that were already existing like the zinc fingers and the talons. But they didn't prove that they didn't do any incellular experiments. Whereas Feng Zhang and George Church, they rapidly introduced this system in cells and showed that it is also effective in cells, as was first suggested by the Charpentier Dotna groups. And the question now is who were the true inventors? Was it Charpentier and Jennifer Dotna, or was it Feng Zhang and George Church who showed that it's effective in cells? And this actually quickly turned into a very ugly debate about who are the true inventors. Which initially didn't start off in a very bad atmosphere. Initially, there was this, paper, this email from Feng Zhang to Jennifer Dotna on the 2nd of January, uh, where he writes, Dear Dr. Dotna, greetings from Boston and a happy new year. I'm an assistant professor at MIT and I've been working on CRISPR. Um, I met you briefly during one of my PhD interviews at Berkeley back in 2004. I've been inspired by your work ever since. Notice. I have a collaboration with Luciana, Luciano Marifini at Rockefeller uh, University, and we've been studying the CRISPR system for genome editing in mammalian cells. The study was recently accepted for publishing in Science, and you can find a copy of the paper attached to this email. The Cas9 system is very powerful. I would love to talk to you with you sometime. Um, I'm sure we have a lot of synergy and perhaps there are things that we could collaborate on in the future. How different did that turn out? Not much later, there are institutes of the Broad Institute, California University ended up in fights, ended up in court debating about who were the true inventors of CRISPR. And quite a few emails and documents got leaked from these um, court uh, investigations. One of which was an email from a student who was applying for a postdoc uh, position in the lab of Jennifer Dotna. And she writes that she was working in the lab of Feng Zhang before, and she was the only one starting to work on CRISPR because the rest of the lab, the whole lab, except me, focused on Talens, which is a different gene editing tool. Um, I was working on the CRISPR project until I had to return to China, and it was only after seeing your in vitro paper that Feng Zhang and Li Kong quickly jumped on the project without letting me know. Um, we did not work out how the system was working before seeing your paper, um, where with, with what she's suggesting with that um, Feng Zhang and Li Kong were not able to use the system until they'd seen the paper from um, Jennifer Dodd about Emmanuel Charpentier, which would suggest 
that Jennifer Dodd and Manuel Charpentier were the true inventors of the CRISPR system. Of course, you have to keep in mind that this student was also applying for a postdoc position, so that's something to keep in the back of our minds when we read these kind of emails. But it does suggest that potentially Feng Zhang was really inspired by the work of Jennifer Dodd. Then in 2016, there was a paper published in Cell, the leading journal Cell, where Eric Lander, the head of the Broad Institute, um, tried to reconstruct the history of CRISPR and celebrating the heroes of CRISPR. At least that's what he pretended that he was writing, but what he was actually doing is he was campaigning for his own two teams at the Broad Institute, trying to upscale the importance of their discoveries and downscaling the importance of the discoveries of the Dot9 Charpentier labs. And you can see this, for instance, in this picture of the paper. So the map is drawn in the way that Boston is suddenly the center of the world where you can find the Broad Institute. As you can see, the different events were uh, ranked chronologically and all of them are in red, except one, which is in blue. Again, the one from Boston, really attracting the attention to this event here in Boston. And um, if you read the legend, it, it becomes really funny. They say that the invention here, nine in Berkeley, was just studying CRISPR in vitro, whereas the discovery from Boston was genome editing in mammalian cells. Do you feel the difference between studying CRISPR in vitro versus genome editing in mammalian cells? So he was really trying to convince the readers and also the people in court that the ones in Boston had made a true discovery um, and that they were the true inventors of this CRISPR technology. Of course, this rapidly set rise to an online firestorm Dozens and dozens of scientists uh, went onto Twitter and really um, went against this. And they wrote things as, like Michael Eisen wrote, Eric Lander and the Broad Institute should really be ashamed of themselves of publishing such map and such history, uh, trying to upscale their own findings. Of course, as you know, the outcome of the Nobel Prize was different. The Nobel Prize was awarded to Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Dotna for the development of a method for genome editing. So luckily the Nobel Prize didn't take this into account and that's perhaps my personal opinion, but at least credited the two researchers that had an actual important contribution to the discovery of CRISPR. However, the things for the patents look slightly different. It seems as if the Broad Institute is winning all the battles for the CRISPR patents. It seems that in court, the patents of the Broad Institute are overruling those from the University of California, at least in the States. In Europe, it's still um, under debate. And it seems that regarding the patents that the Broad Institute have a better position than the uh, University of California. With that, we've come to the end of my presentation. I've shown you um, the good of CRISPR. I've shown you the bad of CRISPR. I've also shown you the potential and I think I've also shown you the ugly. I would like to thank you for your time and I'm gonna share this as my last slide. These are my credentials. If you would have any questions later on, you can still contact me here or you can look for my Twitter, which unfortunately my surname is slightly too long to fit on an entire Twitter handle. So it's Elias Adriansa, but you're most welcome to um, send me a message either over email or Twitter if you have any further questions after today. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elias, very much for the interesting presentation. Um, I think you covered a lot, so it's very broad. Um, and we will now have a look at some questions that were asked in the Q&A section on Zoom and in the YouTube live stream. First question, is it possible to introduce two different modifications with CRISPR by using uh, one gRNA, for example, GFP addition on the end terminus and the RFP addition on the C terminus? Um, so basically the idea is that you would have the GFP and the, at the end terminus and another mo fluorescent molecule at the uh, other terminus. I think in theory it would be possible if you fuse it to Cas9 because I, I guess that's the question. Um, but I think for introducing mutations, um, what you tend to do is you actually have a single guide RNA targeting one specific loci in the genome, and then the repair template would contain either the point mutation or a GFP to introduce it in the DNA. Okay, um, maybe now a more general question. Um, 
Today, there are no approved gene editing therapies such as CRISPR-Cas. Do you think that this will change uh, anytime soon? I actually think so. Um, I, due to time constraints, I removed one of the slides from my presentation, but already in 2016, um, the first clinical trial started using CRISPR um, in patients. Um, so one of the things that CRISPR, I think, could be used in a rather quick way is that imagine you have a situation and someone has a cancer and um, these people are out of therapies. The one thing you could still do is um, take some blood of these patients, modify genes such as PD-1, which is a immune uh, therapy component, um, and then reintroduce these modified cells into the blood of the patient and actually that way use it as an immunotherapy. And that's, that was the first clinical trial in 2016. I think it's, it's close to being finished. Um, and I know a number of other clinical trials are on the way with CRISPR um, components. So I do think that CRISPR will be in the clinic in a, rather soon. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question. Um, how can we be sure that every cell will be infected with only one kind of virus referring to the whole genome screening? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, basically the trick there is that you have to dilute the pool of virus to such an extent that you have on average one viral particle every two or three cells. So you don't calculate for one viral particle per cell. No, you actually calculate one viral particle for every two to three cells. So that if you start a therapy that the cells that didn't receive any viral particle will die anyway. Um, the worst that can happen in such kind of experiments is that one cell gets more than one viral particle, more than one guide RNA, and will be knocked out for more than one gene. And that will really mess up your entire analysis. So the, the answer is very simple, diluting. And this has to be optimized uh, before you do the actual screen. Okay, um, then we, uh, I think there's more um, a practical question. Are guide RNA, RNAs inserted in the zygote with micro uh, injections or how does that yeah. work? Usually what uh, I think the, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. So perhaps there's people out there who know more about this, but I think the golden standard at this point is people inject a Cas9 protein with a single guide RNA together that you prepare them in the lab, you mix them into one complex. And then this complex is injected in the zygote as most people do in cells. You prepare it in the lab, you mix the two components and then you introduce these components into the cells. Okay. Um... Yeah, we have a lot of questions, so I'm scrolling a bit through them. Um, what is the likelihood to achieve a successful gene editing in human primary cells? Um, like cells extracted from biopsy and propagated as organoids through CRISPR technology. Um, so it slightly depends on the kind of primary cells that you're referring to. So I think in general, primary cells are slightly more difficult to, to edit. I think the reason is not necessarily that the CRISPR system is not efficient. I think the main reason is trying to get your components into these primary cells. You have to find a way to transfect or electroporate your cells to introduce these components into the cells. However, once it's in the cells, I can guarantee you that the system is very effective at gene editing. Um, with regard to organoids, um, there was a very recent paper in Science by a uh, lab from Vienna um, where they actually did a, a genome scale screen in organoids in a very clever way. Um, so it's, it's definitely possible and, and it's literally on the horizon. I think the first studies are coming out now and I expect more to come out very soon. Okay, um, I see also a question about um, organ transplantation. Can CRISPR-Cas9 stop the rejection of organs when someone undergoes an organ transplantation? Um, so basic, so repeat it one more time. So basically the idea is that you have an organ transplantation mm -hmm. um, and then you'd be, when it's ex vivo, you would be actually modifying it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that that's possible. I think it, it's sort of along the lines of what I just mentioned before is when 
Um, with this therapy, that is the clinical trial that started in 2016, they would have a cancer patient, they would take the blood cells, they would modify the blood cells and reintroduce them into the, in the human body. And then they would be able to recognize a tumor and degrade the tumor as an immunotherapy. Um, I think in theory, this would be possible. I, I don't know of any examples on this, um, but I think it's realistic that this exists. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, a few years ago, Cas9 Nikaza was developed. How much has this helped to reduce of target effects? Yeah, so the debate on the Cas9 Nikase has, I think, um, people who are really in favor of the molecule, there are people who prefer to use the regular Cas9. Um, it's definitely being used a lot, um, but it's perhaps being used more in a different setting than you can imagine. Um, the base editors, they're actually fused to the Cas9 Nikase. And also the prime editors are fused to the Cas9 Nikase because somehow these systems work better if you just got one DNA strand and then allow the base editing molecules fused to the Cas9 protein to actually edit the DNA. Um, but definitely for scientific experiments where you like to work with two Nikases, all you would have to do is use two guide RNAs so that each guide RNA targets a slightly different region. Each of them introduces a single uh, strand break and together you actually have the double strand break. And if they're not too far apart, that's definitely a very effective system. Okay, I see a lot of questions in, uh, in, in the chat and they're also very specific. So maybe I think it's better that uh, if they still have questions after this lecture, they uh, contact you personally that you can um, reply them by email or something. Uh, and then I think we can here end our webinar. Uh, I really want to thank you for, uh, for giving this presentation. I want to thank the audience for joining us tonight. Uh, yeah, Elias, normally we would give you a small gift, but unfortunately <laughs> that's not possible, but we'll do that uh, later anyway. Um, so yeah, I'll wish everyone uh, a good evening and I hope we can join all of you in our next webinar, which will be on the 2nd of December about astrochemistry. So yeah, thank you, Elias, again, and have a nice evening, everyone. Bye. Stay safe. Bye.